Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me all right? A hundred percent. Thank you so much for joining me here today, Larry. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, out of respect for you, Larry, I'm going to do mm -hmm. one big solid and I'm not going to use any notes today because I've learned that you <laughs> never use any, any notes as an interviewer. So I've always you can got use all the notes you like. I've always got that almost as not um, as a crutch, but almost as like a safety net of sorts. But with you in particular, out of respect for your journalism and your approach, <laughs> I think it's only fair that I do the same because I think that uh, well, I'm learning from nice. you. So. Oh, you're very, you're very kind. You're yeah, so kind. Larry Flick, the one and only, you are an inspiration to me. And I believe to many others in the music industry, it really oh, is an man. absolute honor and pleasure to have you on Sonic Dorms today. Uh, I'm Max, by the way, as I'm sure you know. But honestly, it means the world to me that you have taken oh. the time to do this with me. Well, why wouldn't I? You're very kind and you asked me and, you know, um, it's nice to be asked. You know, when you've been doing this a long time. You don't take for granted that people care about what you do and who you are and what you've got to say. You know, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make is that they assume that the world cares. So you should always be grateful when they do. That's incredible. And honestly, uh, we need more people such as yourself out in the world today, Larry. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, also, just as a part of Sonic Dorms, I always like looking at the environment of your so-called dorm room. I love seeing Star Trek Voyager in the background, yes. if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes, so I'm uh, right now talking to you from my little office in the house that I uh, now live in here in Wales, in the UK. Um, it's the house actually that I share with my husband of 18 years. And um, this is, I will be honest with you, this is his. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never seen an episode of Star Trek. Oh, it's okay. It's okay, Larry. I, I appreciate but, just the thought but, of it being there. Yeah, no, but I mean, he, he loves it. And it's actually the greatest conversation piece of my career. Because ever since I've been, I've been working from this office for just a little, little less than a year. And, um, you know, I kind of, position the camera right where we are because it's a little nicer than you know the printer that's over there <laughs> um so but yeah i mean everyone acknowledges lots of trekkies out there good for me yeah i, I think it's almost never like seen a, an episode though it, yeah but but it, it's almost like a, a good luck charm in the background if you will yeah it is actually it is you know and it's kind of like this is like a, a hybrid of Shane and me. That right there is a picture of uh, Bianca Del Rio, who's a good friend of mine, who's a drag artist uh, from America, and just a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a uh, it's home, which is a really nice place to be. I'm not gonna lie, Larry. I it, one of the things I got into, not to get sidetracked here, but one of the things I got into during the COVID peak COVID era, if you will, was my uh my girlfriend got me into watching uh rupaul's drag race so there's a lot of uh, so, going on. so i got familiar ever. i got familiar and actually my foray back into going to concerts again was going to go see a drag show and uh, i was it was almost like a very therapeutic cathartic experience it was like going to church for me honestly i don't know if it's because of the concert deprivation or just the livelihood of the experience maybe a mixture of both but it really Probably made me both yeah, maybe a fan. Probably though. both. I mean, drag artists are a very um, are a very energetic lot. They're you know the new generation rock stars. So why not? <laughs> well, well, just just to just to get go go back for a second. The reason why I fell in love with what you do initially was um, becoming a subscriber to Sirius XM a few, uh, about five, six years ago, um, becoming a huge fan of volume just because volume gave people like myself and the volume maniacs as they, as they, as we call ourselves an opportunity 
to conglomerate and, 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 and socialize with other people that were into music as much as we were. And listening mm. to you um, with the flick of the week on, uh, mm. on volume, on, on, um, on feedback with Nick and Lori, uh, looking forward to that every Friday because you had such a wide range of, uh, of taste. I, I Judas Priest. And then you had, uh, then there was the Demi Lovato track. It didn't matter. You were such an open-minded music listener. And I appreciate that because I am as well. So. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think the the bread and butter of what people like you and I do for a living is uh, is flexibility, right? You know, I mean, it's good to have a specialty. You know, I have a couple of specialties. Um, you know, it helps you build a, a core audience and a and a base to fall back on during the leaner times. But if you want to advance, I believe you need to, you know, sweeten that pot, if you will, with um, with an understanding of all music. You know, I think I think there's something to be said for being able to talk intelligently about a whole bunch of different music um, and, 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 you know, listen to it through the, the ears, the lens, um, the mind of the people that are, those songs are intended for. I had a conversation with a, with a very young music critic a couple of weeks ago and, you know, she's very, um, very British and very, keyed into young artists makes sense right great um but she didn't have all the great references that one should have if you're going to do the work that you and i do um and and i think it's necessary to it's necessary to understand where your specialty fits in the landscape of music right so that you know you need to understand that there's a difference between a good Judas Priest and a bad Judas Priest record. There's a very big difference. And that band in particular has made brilliant records and really bad records. Um, and same with you know any artist, you need to be able to discern and then see where they all fit. It's like a mosaic, right? That's what music is. So yeah, I mean, and also I've always just been a very, voracious music listener from my earliest days really from like when I was five or six yeah and, and going back I, I always love to know the roots of whoever I speak to musically I love mm -hmm. to know where it all started what were your earliest influences as an avid music fanatic well, um, I was uh, born and raised in New York, in the Bronx, the Boogie Down Bronx. Um, I was born in the 60s, um, but most of my music consumption really started around 1970. Um, uh, we moved a lot and I was super shy. So I got a radio as a gift one year for Christmas. And it became my inseparable companion. I carried it everywhere. It was shaped like a white baseball and had one, like a long earpiece. Um, not unlike the, you know, the Apple earbuds that we see now. And I started out just listening to the local, you know, the New York top 40 stations of the day, um, AM radio. And, um, it was very much steeped in pure pop. I mean, we're talking, um, you know, the Jackson Five. Bay City Rollers. The Bay City Rollers. <laughs> but there was also rock and roll. See, back then, Top 40 Radio was a real collection of pop music is, is short for popular music, meaning all the songs that have risen up from the different niches and the different genres, right? Pop makes it the, the most popular of the niches. And so back then pop radio meant the best of the best of each, each genre. So, you know, you would listen to, you know, 77 WABC, which was my station of choice back when I was a little boy. 
and you would hear uh, a Basie Rolla song, and then you would hear a Janis Joplin song, and then you would hear, you know, um, a sol- an Aretha Franklin record. And it was, that's what it was, you know, uh, I was raised by AM radio. And um, when I was six years, my parents were hippies and they used to have house parties. Um, lots of people coming over and, you know, drinking beer and eating food and dancing in the living room, pushing back, you know, the coffee table and dancing around. And I learned at the age of six that if I could keep them dancing, I would play the, the 45s on, our, on the family stereo. And I learned at that age very quickly that if I could keep them dancing, no one was going to send me to bed. So at six years old, I was DJing my parents' house parties and um, would be up until the next day. Everyone would kind of fall asleep and I'd still be sitting there playing 45s. But so I learned, I learned how uh, kind of primally, you know, intuitively, how people responded to different songs and what songs they were not going to respond to and stayed away from them because if they didn't respond to those songs, it meant I had to go to bed. Um, so from there, I was hooked. You know, I mean, a combination of hanging out with the grown-ups, because like, I didn't have friends as, a, you know, other kids who were friends, and I was very shy. So the combination of hanging out with the grown-ups and then having these songs and these radio DJs as kind of like my, my personal secret companions um, created this lifelong tie to music that, you know, I mean, I still have the same relationship to music. I still listen to music and regard music in a very personal way way and i still listen to djs um who you know keep me company you know it was very that was really it and then from there i just sort of started you know even though no one in my family can play music um we were a very musically inclined family we were all consuming music my mom was into pop and r&b my father was into rock and roll hard rock and woodstock era rock and I just spent all of my time in their records playing them and listening to them. And eventually when I could read properly, studying them. And um, the rest, you know, kind of flew from there. Now, how do you use all that you had gathered then to your advantage once you do become involved with these publications and whatnot? How, how does that come into play? Well, I... I um, when I was a kid, I would get my allowance. I would get $10 a week from my dad. And I would spend part of it on two or three 45 singles uh, that were really hot and on a couple of magazines, teen magazines, music magazines. And I was always just fascinated by like, how did you get how do you get to be in the box on my radio? How do you get to be on those pages? I thought it was an impossible thing, but I wanted to figure out how that was. And so I went about learning how to, how to do it. And um, when I was about 17, I just started writing and writing and writing for anybody who would let me for free. Um, and that eventually led me to my college, a couple of college newspapers. And that led me then to local zines, you know, like um, the Long Island Ear, which was kind of like a, you know, a bar rag that played, you know, you wrote about heavy metal bands, which was one of my specialties when I first started. Um, and I just learned by making a lot of mistakes uh, from every opportunity I, I got to learn how to ask people how to get from here to there, from here to there, from here to there. And um, eventually it led me to um, a part-time job at Billboard when I was in my early 20s. Um, and you know that was after actually, I took an internship at a company called Gold Mountain Records. Um, and dropped out of school 
and went on the road with a couple of bands and just became involved in the rock and roll life at the age of 21. Then I went back to school, finished up school, wound up a billboard. But so I had, yeah, so I just sort of, I was just curious and I was on a mission to ask anyone who would talk to me. Um, and I didn't have any context. I didn't know how to do it. So I relied on what was in front of me. I, you know, would look at the back of a record and I would see that the offices for modern records, which was the label of Stevie Nicks, who was my favorite artist at the time, and still is one of my favorites, had an office and I knew where the office was. So I wrote down the address and I dropped off a resume in person and they called me back for an interview and gave me an internship. It wasn't modern records anymore, but the company that it became gave me my first opportunity. You know, we didn't have the internet back in the early 80s when I was starting. So you had to kind of hustle. You had to kind of, you know, work the shoe leather, as they say. You had to be willing to cold call and have people hang up on you and all of that. So I did all of that and um, did it until people started to talk to me. I did a lot of work for free for a very, very long time. For a very long time. I and mean, even when I worked for Gold Mountain and I was on the road with Kiss and Keel and the Power Station, yeah, I was making like 150 bucks, 250 bucks a week, you know, which even back in the 80s was not very much. I mean, it certainly went farther then than it, than it would now, but, um, you know, I just, I had to do it. So I did. You know, you sacrifice when it's something you really want. Yeah, I was going to say it's incredible because for me, that alone, you sharing that story with me is a real inspiration. Because for me, it this has been nothing but a labor of love. And it seems like mm. for you, the equivalent of that back then was also just a labor of love. It wasn't about making money necessarily, it wasn't it? It was all about the passion that you had about music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I defied my parents. You know, I come from um, a blue collar, an uneducated blue collar family, lower, you know, lower class, right? My father uh, was a handyman in a high rise apartment building in midtown Manhattan until he died. Um, you know, we had no money and yet we always had enough of what we needed. Um, and my job as the only son of my immediate family was to go out, get an education and become uh, a white collar guy. That was how my father put it. He wanted me to never use my hands and he wanted me to wear a tie to work every day. That was how he defined success. And um, I tried it. I really did. I worked for an insurance company for almost a year uh, before I took the part-time job at Billboard. Um, but, you know, they were not happy with what I did because I was taking risks that they didn't want me to take, but I had to. And um, I mean, they let me live in their home until I was 29 and able to support myself. There were a lot of years where I couldn't support myself, but I was doing it just because I had to, and I was making whatever I could. Um, you know, I think um, there's something to be said for paying those kind of dues. I don't know that I believe that people are willing to pay those kind of dues. I don't know that you necessarily ne have to pay them, and, and to the degree that I did back then, the industry was different, the world was different. But, um, you know, I, uh, the company I work for now, I'm, I'm managing two interns. And their expectations are way beyond reality. You know, and sometimes I sound like a broker record saying, back in my day, you know, back in the black and white Flintstone days. Um, but it was different. And every victory felt like you had just won a Grammy. 
It was good. I loved it. I wouldn't have changed any part of the journey. Really. That that's really inspiring. I, I we do live in different times right now. That is part of my struggle, but also part of my will to succeed in doing this because I believe in music and I believe in the power of music. And I think that we need more tastemakers out there talking about music and 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 to actually care about it. And I actually have cared about music all my life and. I don't see enough of that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it, no, it's I, beautiful. It really is. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we measure music differently now. Now it's all algorithms and social media numbers, and I totally get it. I completely get it. Um, we've built the machine, and now it's operating, and we can't get mad at that because we built it. But... Um, if you don't care about it, then it's just cold and clinical. Now, here's the thing. People have been complaining about music being cold and clinical since the dawn of time. You know, there are a lot of music historians who will, you know, do whatever they can to debunk the music that gave me the passion to forge through um because i liked a lot of really you know corny music i still like a lot of corny music um i've always been a bit of a populist that way um but there was still a different kind of passion then and a different kind of expectation different kind of understanding that you weren't going to get there unless you were really willing to commit you know like I, I was working not too long ago with an artist um and and he was bemoaning the amount of time he had to spend on social media and and i said you know i was trying to find out why he felt like well it's very invasive and all these things and i'm like okay so how else would you sell your record and you know, he's like, well, I don't know. I was like, okay, well then first of all, there's a problem, you know, because we do live in an era where social media is one of the primary ways that you sell your music, especially in this age of COVID. And I said, and you know, so every time you think you're sacrificing too much, because you say, I, I feel like I'm giving up too much of myself by sitting on social media every day. And I would say, okay, well, that's interesting. But what if I told you that you would have to pack off your clothes, drop your dog off at your best friend's house, get in a car, and go away for the next six months to a year to try to sell your record? Would sitting at home on your social media feel like that much of a sacrifice? And he said, I don't know. And I'm like, well, because that's how we sold records. Not that long ago. I'm not talking about the Flintstone days. I mean, as recent as the, you know, the early 2000s, you had to leave your home and your family and your community and disappear from your daily life to sell your records. And there was no guarantee it was going to happen. You could lose your shirt, come home with your tail between your legs. You have a better shot at selling records now in the social media age, and your mom brings you a cheese sandwich while you're doing it. <laughs> you know, and you do it in a room with Star Trek photos or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm talking, I'm kind of prattling on, but I guess my point is. No, please do, Larry. I mean, there's something, is but this. But I mean, I think that there's something to be said for thinking about the various ways that you should work for it. You shouldn't be, you should want to earn it. It's really sweeter. When I got my first byline in Billboard, it was the, you know, the culmination of, you know, over a decade of work. And it, the article was like this big, you know? And um, 
I think I went on and got drunk that day. <laughs> I'll stop talking for a second and let you ask for a talk. No, no, Larry, I, I, it, you have no idea. Like to me, this opportunity alone to me is like winning a Grammy or an award of any sort, because <laughs> you're, you're, you're such, kind. seriously, you're such a well of knowledge. And I think that for me personally, I want, I want, this needs to be talked about. And I feel like having you as a guest on Sonic Dorms really just exemplifies what I'm trying to achieve here with this platform that I, I've been just building grassroots really for a little over a year now it's really about having credible people on speaking the truth about music and you know you you are an incredible wordsmith and really uh an inspiration to me so it, honestly well, I, talk away please do well no you're, you're you're very very kind and i do i do appreciate it uh, more than you know you know i mean listen none of us have the answer we just have an answer and, you know, there are many days where I think, oh, my God, what have I done? What have I done wrong? I should have been more successful. I could have taken that road instead of this road, and it could have taken me to someplace better or higher. You always, when you live a creative life uh, and a non-traditional life, you're always going to wonder those things. But I, you know really believe that if you're doing it for the right reason um and you and you are forever checking in on your your definition of success and reimagine it and re redefine it you will you will find what you're looking for or find what you need you know sometimes you don't even know if what you're consuming is going to lead you to where you want to go. When I say consuming, I mean like the information, the knowledge, the, you know, the education. You know, I mean, I started my life wanting to be an actor. And, you know, there was a long period of my life where I would say, oh my God, I wasted nine years studying in theater. Um, all while trying to write, all while obsessing about music, but my focal point was theater and I thought well that's not going to work out because I just don't have what it takes and I don't have the fortitude to go after that and my gosh what a waste and then I realized uh two years into working as a radio broadcaster at Sirius XM where I was for 18 years that I was using my theater education every day without knowing it because I don't like to talk <laughs> as I rattle on. I don't like to talk. I'm very shy. I'm very introverted. Um, this kind of stuff, talking makes me nervous. It makes me feel like I'm going to say something stupid. And, and it's very exhausting. But all the things I learned in studying character work and stage work and improvisation and all these different things like these great so lucky to work with so many great teachers and, and thinkers of theater um i use them every day and they've helped they help me have a nice a nice ride in radio you know they gave me the courage to talk to the people I always wanted to talk to it gave me the the it taught me how to find it right so i'm telling you all that as if to say you know you don't know how you can use the knowledge you're accruing until it's right there in front of you but everything is valuable every experience is valuable every swing of the bat you take is valuable whether you get to what you think is going to be that moment of success or not it will lead you to somewhere where that you need to be if you're willing to be open and 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 acknowledge that it takes time and experience and mistakes lots of mistakes to to see that we all start out with like a very kind of prototypical view of what we want, right? You want to be a cowboy, you want to be a fireman, you want to be, you know, whatever. Um, 
and then it's if you if you're really really paying attention it can morph into your special unique thing you know i wanted to be an actor it didn't happen writing was something that came a little more naturally to me music was my deepest passion even more than acting and you know the two things i've had the most success with are the things i didn't try to do the things that happened because i was just soaking it all in and saying yes more than i said no and that was being a writer a journalist and a radio broadcaster you know who knew that a theater degree would lead me to those two things but they did um so i don't know i mean i think that you know you should you know when i look at what you're doing and i've spent some time studying what you're doing because i wanted to get to know what you're doing you know well before we talked and i think you're doing a really good job and i think um you know your your sincerity and your earnest passion for what you do are going to get you where you need to go you're so young you don't know where it's going to be though what it looks like i know you have a fantasy of what you think it looks like we all have that fantasy right i thought you know many different i had many different fantasies some of them were real some of them actually happened and some of them didn't but if you're paying close attention it will show itself and it'll be your specific your unique version of it and you know you're well on your way you know but and that's why um i'm always you know i'm always a bit when people kind of start throwing um cliches about what they want you know like i want to be a role model no you don't you really don't you want you want the wealth of a role model but if you really want to be a role model you go join the peace corps <laughs> you want to be famous it's okay it's all right um you know and if you use the fame that comes with being success you know if you use that fame well then then you will be a role model but you don't start out wanting to be a role model nobody starts out wanting to be a role model role models happen by accident just like the first time the second someone tells you they're cool that what they really said is i'm not cool i'm a loser right i'm a role model no you're not you're probably doing all kinds of things you shouldn't want to be doing and you feel guilty about it speaking, <laughs> like, again, speaking the stream truth. of consciousness stream of consciousness forgive me no don't do you, don't apologize that that exists what do you want exactly. to know what do you want to know what do you want to know? don't apologize larry that's exactly what i like to do here i like to create conversation not just uh question by question interviews that's not what this is about it's about creating a real connection and hopefully that transponds over to anybody who decides to listen is that connection yeah. finding that connection with uh, between me and and said guest but um you you alluded to a few things that i'd like to um ask you about because of your shyness. I mean, that's something that I myself can relate to because I starting into this, I loved communicating with people, but it wasn't well developed. It was something that I felt I needed to develop. And over the course of a little over a year now, now I feel like I got a better handle on it, but always the idea of this doesn't need to be intimidating. This doesn't need to be something larger than it just needs to be me and another human being having an interaction. And hopefully having a, a great one at that, um, or a not so great one, we learn, as you, you mentioned, but what has been your approach since day one? What have you learned from talking to just anybody in music? Um, you know, it changes all the time. My approach has changed dramatically over the years. But, uh, you know, I wish I could make music. I have no musical aptitude. Um, I'm tone deaf, so I can't sing. Um, I just can't. I, I tried. Actually, I was very lucky. I had someone who funded um, the opportunity to make a couple of uh, demos as a producer. I found it tedious. Um, but i'm i'm obsessed with people who make music and who have the skill and the talent and i always 
you know, I, I, I spend most, I've spent most of my life talking to people who make music or who produce music or who write music, trying to understand what it feels like. like what's it like to open your mouth and have this thing come out that's so beautiful? What's it like to hold your hands like this, you know, in a, in a piano prone position, drop them and all of a sudden notes come and they're beautiful. What do, like, how does that connect with your brain and then to your emotion? How, what, how, why, please tell me. And um, no one ever has an answer, but I'm gonna keep asking. And so I've found different ways of asking over the years. And you know, the older you get, the more philosophical you become. And so I approach it more from a philosophical point of view now than when I was younger. Um, you know, that's I've always that's what I want to know from musicians. I mean, you know, there's all the practical stuff. You know, why are you writing this kind of music? What's you know, what's your motivation? Blah blah blah. But it really comes down to what does it feel like? What do, like what does that feel like? If I could sing, I'd never stop. I swear, I would never ever stop. I would probably die because I would lose breath from singing all the time. And um, so that's my mission. Uh, I haven't gotten a good answer yet. I've gotten a lot of interesting answers. Uh, musicians are often kind of rattled when I ask that question because they don't have an answer and they feel funny about that, but they shouldn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I always approach, I, I approach them like, you know, what, what are you trying to tell me? Also, like when I'm listening to a record, what are you trying to tell me? You must be trying to tell me something. Um, even if the thing you're trying to tell me is love me, like me, I need money, it's okay, you know? Um, but what are you trying to tell me? What am I supposed to take away from this? Am I supposed to feel, am I supposed to feel good for three minutes? Okay, I can get into that. Am I supposed to feel motivated politically? Am I supposed to feel a kinship with you? You know, I want to know, and then I try to figure out if I can climb onto that same plane with them. You know, I tend to like more intimate music than not. Um, I like to feel like there's, even, even in like a Judas Priest record, you know, there's a conversation that happens. Is there a conversation for me to have with you? Um, as a listener, is there room for me inside your song? You know, like, it's one thing to be confessional, it's another thing to be indulgent. And so I'm also looking for that, right? Um, and I want to know everything. But I also want to be able to feel like I can see or hear myself inside the song. Um, I want to feel like, you know, my favorite records are the ones where I feel like the artist is sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear or shouting in my ear, um, which is why I tend to not tend to like records where the voice is mixed pretty high up. You know, if the voice is buried or if the words are too cryptic, pass, not my thing. But um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking, I'm looking for intention. I'm looking for motivation, and I'm looking for some uh, soul. And when I say soul, I don't mean like R and B. I mean like, you know, where from from what part of your body is the music coming? Is it coming from your your neck or your chest or your balls or your knees? Like from where in you is it coming? If you don't have, if, if I can't feel that, then we have nothing to talk about. Um, and most music is coming from somewhere. So there's always something to talk about. Um, yeah. One thing I've noted from, from your interviews, uh, and I've heard a lot of them, is the fact that when I get through one, it almost feels like 
you're not really interviewing them. It almost feels like a therapy session of, of sorts. And I, <laughs> and I say that in the, in the best of ways, because that's something no. that I've, I've honestly strived for every time I interview somebody, I don't ever want it to feel like I would definitely want to make a connection or try to attempt to make a connection um, with whoever I'm talking to. I don't want it to feel like a question by question sort of ordeal. That's not what I'm doing this for. Yeah. I mean, that's why I don't write my questions. Well, I don't write my questions for two reasons. Um, the first one's very actually very practical. I'm dyslexic. And so if, I mean, I do write, I, I write copious notes and it's really so that I can kind of organize my, my mind, but I don't, I have them in front of me just in case I freak out. Um, but in 37 years, I haven't freaked out except one time. Well, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, if you have written everything, if you've written a script, then what you've done is you've written out the opportunity for anything special or spontaneous to happen. And um, so I kind of go in knowing what I want. Like, I know what I need to know. I go in, you know, when you're doing, you know, particularly a radio interview, um, different than a, than a written, a, an article, because an article has all the stuff built in. But if you're, doing a, if you're doing a recorded interview, you know that you have to get the plugs in. You know why they're there. And I always make sure that the reason why they're there is tended to immediately. So that they and everybody else can go, And they always do. They always do. Because they come in and they're like, are you going to talk about my record? Are you going to plug my record? Are you going to plug my tour? Are you going to... Blah, 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 blah. And I just kind of go right in. Get all that stuff out of the way. They'll, everyone involved, including pub, people like publicists and managers and anybody else who's hanging around during an interview, will calm down because they've gotten what they need. And they'll know that they're going to get more. And then I just start to kind of find the things that I either heard on the record that feel real or honest, or I'll try my best to read their body language. I'll listen to certain words that they say and how they say them. Believe it or not, you can get lots of hints right there, you know? Um, if someone, if someone is particularly articulate, you know, they probably are, are, are a big reader. So it's always kind of interesting to kind of take them down that road or any number of things, you know, it's really kind of like, it just comes from, like if you are in, um, if you're in a bar and you're trying to pick someone up for the night, you know what you need to do. It's very similar. All right, I'm trying to get you to like me. And in liking me, hopefully you'll tell me things. Sometimes that requires setting the table and telling them things first. And sometimes it's saying, do you feel like people listen to you? Or do you feel heard? And when I say heard, do you feel like people are really understanding what you're saying? And that always breaks down, you know, a, a barrier. Um, when in doubt, I used to have this, I, I created this trick. I'm going to tell you a trick and you should use it. Let's hear it. Okay. When I first started interviewing artists and I didn't really know how to connect because I was green and I was stupid and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I learned very quickly how a record was sequenced, an album. And, and this still holds true, still holds true to this very day. I interviewed someone two days ago and I tried it and I was right. The first three songs are the singles. The next two to three songs, next two songs, uh, two to three songs are the songs that the A&R person, the person who helped put the record together need to have on the record for whatever reason. Right, whether it be because they made a deal with the producer or 
whatever. They, they're just like, there's songs that the label wants there. If the artist is either already a writer or trying to be a writer or trying to kind of communicate more with their music, the seventh song down are their songs and they tend to be the songs that they're most invested in. And so if you're feeling like this isn't going well, and I've had many, oh my God, I've had countless interviews where I thought this is, I'm dying here. How do I save this? I say, okay, can we talk about a couple of songs on the record that are not singles? And they'll always say yes. And I'll say, tell me about track seven. I really like that song, my favorite song on the record. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they'll say that's my favorite song too. And I'll say, because it feels like it's the most honest song. And I'll say, because it is. And then you're in. Incredible. And if the, rec if the artist is trying to have a career, the 10th or 12th or final song is the song that is going to give them, give the listener a hint of where they're going. So that when I interviewed Kesha, for example, um, the very first album, which was the album that had TikTok and all those hits. Um, by the time I got to her, she was very kind of like rehearsed and all of that. And um, we were getting along, but it was very superficial. And it was one of the rare, 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 rare times where the track seven will didn't work. But I said, this last song, I held my finger up like I'm holding up right now on camera. This last song, this is where you're going, isn't it? And she completely changed. She goes, yes, how could you tell? And I'm like, because I'm psychic. <laughs> I started <laughs> laughing. And, and it, you know, it let, and, 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 if, and, and actual truth, I mean, it sounds like a cynical way of working through an interview. And it is a little bit. But if you listen to those records, if you listen to a record, the less commercial songs are there because those are the songs that the artist really loves. So sometimes you go for those songs and you see what's in those songs that have some sort of purpose of existence. Um, and it always works. It really does. It really, really does. But yeah, so I don't write anything down because you miss stuff. You miss stuff. Because the thing that everyone wants you to be rehearsed to do will sometimes block out the thing that is right in front of you. You know, like I, my, my breakout interview in broadcasting was with Adam Lambert. He had just put out his first record and, um, you may or may not remember he appeared on the American Music Awards and he kissed the guy and mm -hmm. it was scandal. And I got him the very next day at the end of his press day. It was like the day before Thanksgiving. I'll never forget it. And it was a very big deal that he was coming up because everyone thought, oh my God, this is our chance to get, this is like before Sirius XM was like the monolith that it is now. And um, I mean, we had some we had some juice, but we didn't have the juice that the company has now. And um, and he agreed to talk to me because we had met a few times. And you know, I'm gay, and you know, I was supportive of him when he was on Idol, and blah blah blah. I got the interview, and everyone around me was like, "You have to talk to him about the kiss." And I'm like, "He's already done twelve interviews about the kiss. We're not talking about the kiss. You have to talk to him about the kiss." And I'm like. No, we're not doing talk about, you know. And then eventually I just said, okay, yes, we're going to talk about the kiss, knowing that I wasn't going to ask him about it. And so everyone, we're, we're in a studio and everyone's in, you know, in the control room looking through the glass, like, when is he going to do it? When's he going to do it? When's he going to do it? And we're talking and things are going okay. You know, Adam was tired. It was like in the evening. He was really at the end of a very busy day. And, you know, I had, um, a, what no one knew was a fake script in front of me that I wasn't really reading from. But I looked down and I looked at him 
And I noticed that he kept going like this with his shirt, he kept pulling it out as if to make more fabric room around his body. And I was like, I do that. In my mind, I'm thinking, I do that. But why is he doing that? And I said, Adam, were you ever fat? And his face like just froze and his eyes opened really wide. And he said, yes. How did you know? And I'm like, I didn't know. But you're pulling on your shirt as if you're afraid your stomach is going to show. That's what I do. And he was like, holy shit. And I'm like, so how, how, how fat were you? And I didn't ask you in a nasty way. I said, listen, I'm pushing three bills. How much were you? And he goes, I was 260. And I was like, wow, that must have sucked. And he goes, it really sucked. And we talked for 10 minutes about what it was like to, for him to be overweight and try to do what he's doing. And we talked from there about self-image and self-loathing and the pain that went into losing the weight. And that's what got picked up. And then after that, after that I knew I had it. And he was like, he said, and that's why I kissed the guy. So I actually didn't have to ask him. He's like, that's why I kissed the guy on TV because the fat guy in me wanted to kiss a pretty guy. And suddenly we had something nobody else had. We had Adam Lambert, the biggest star of the moment, admitting that he was hugely fat and that his inner fat kid kissed the guy. That's why he did it. And it exploded, it got picked up worldwide and nobody told me what to do ever again. <laughs> what an incredible and, story. And none of that would have happened if I had written everything down and then followed the list, right? So instead I kind of pretended I was doing that, but I just looked at him and I studied him in a way that wasn't too obnoxious and hoped for the best and you know sometimes it doesn't work you know it's not foolproof just like not every conversation is fruitful or interesting or engaging do you feel but, like you have a deeper i'm sorry for cutting you off but do you feel like you sure. have a deeper understanding of just people in general as far as like you you just have this intuitive sense of reading the room and analyze you develop you develop it over years. The older you get, the better you become at it. Um, and when you have a you know a bunch of things happen to you in life, you know the older you are, the longer the list of bad things that have happened to you stack up, and those give you perspective. And if you use that perspective in a way that's loving and you know empathetic, then it makes you more available and it makes it makes you more receptive to what's coming into the room and some people come into the room and they just will not be they will not be cracked the bigger stars tend to be like that because they're so rehearsed and they're so like you really actually let me fix that let me let me amend that the the biggest stars can be cracked the next level below them can't be. So that if you're talking to someone who is famous, they're rehearsed and getting them to tell you something that, they, that is not something that they ever tell anybody else is very hard to do. But if you're talking to like a really big star like Madonna or David Bowie or Bono, all of whom I've interviewed, um, they're waiting for someone to take them somewhere else. They're begging for it. And so you just have to kind of be available to it. And all you got to do, honestly, here's an easy tip until you develop your own sixth sense is read the last three interviews that they've had posted and then ask anything but what's in those interviews. Not that hard.
you know? If everyone's asking Madonna about her hair, then ask about her shoes, you know, to give you like a kind of superficial example. Um, but yes, yeah, so the only time I ever freaked out, by the way, was with Madonna, who's the hardest interview I've ever done. I've interviewed her nine times. So I got it right eventually. But um, but there was one time where we did an interview that neither one of us wanted to do. But we did it, and it was a disaster. It was for her GV2 record. Um, and the one thing you must never forget about Madonna is that she does not like to talk about her past. She views it as being redundant and she just doesn't like to do it. So setting up an interview for a greatest hits record was like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? But everyone on her in her camp said she wants to do it. And I talked, this was kind of like interview five or six. So we knew each other, you know, as much as you can know Madonna. Um, so she agreed to do it. She agreed to do like three interviews and one of them was with me. And I kept saying, I don't really want to do this because I don't really know how to ask her about, you know, Vogue. How do I ask her about Vogue? She doesn't want to talk about Vogue. Um, and um, it was just, it just didn't work. It didn't work. She, you know, I, I, every angle I found, she she was in a bad mood. I was in a nervous mood. It was a collision of anxiety and fear. And it was 15 excruciating minutes. Um, and I thought, well, there you go. I'll never talk to her again. And then 15 months later, I was talking to her and it was great. Um, but yeah, that was the one time I freaked out. And she's the only artist I've ever written questions for. Wow. Yeah, she's the only artist that, you know, like if I talk to her again, I will write down those questions. But I'll tell you what, I screwed up royally um, during that interview where I was freaking out because I had my questions written. I was petrified because she was clearly in a bad mood. And she dropped a hint that I didn't hear because I was so tied to my sheet of paper about working with Pharrell Williams. And I didn't hear it because I was just so glued to my paper and so glued to like the script and so glued to like the fear. And I broken all of my rules and I missed it. And she said, oh, I gotta go see Pharrell. And I just said, okay. And I didn't say what I should have said, which is, why are you seeing Pharrell? And one of the stupidest things I've ever done, because it just went right past me. And when the interview aired, because we had to air it, you know, every call we took that day was, why didn't you ask her about Pharrell? <laughs> Yeah, you blow it sometimes. But what an artist, though. To, I mean, it's Madonna. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna go down, go down in flames. Yeah. Uh, and, and <laughs> someone, someone else that you've worked with that was very notor uh, notorious for being uh, very um, private. I've heard you had some time working with Prince in particular. Yes. Is that true? Yes, I was a consultant for him and Paisley Park Records during the last three years that Paisley Park existed. Uh, it was while I was a dance music editor at Billboard. Um, he was a fan of my column, which still makes me feel weird to say out loud, but it's true. And, um, and he wanted me, he wanted to learn about dance music. He wanted to learn about house music. Um, and so he went to, he had his people call me and set up a meeting and we arranged all above the board, everybody at my company knew I was doing it, uh, that I would uh, consult with Prince. I, it was a simple deal. I, for three years, I sent him care packages of great records and DJ reels and producer remixer reels. And I would write him a little 
report, kind of like a private column. And I would FedEx it to him on Friday, he'd get it Saturday. And they paid me quite well for that for three years. Um, and during those three years, I um, did not write about prints for the magazine uh, for conflict of interest. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was I didn't spend an enormous amount of time with him, but I did spend some time with him. I uh, we had a, a really interesting first meeting uh, at a place in New York that is no longer there called the Riga Royale Hotel. I remember him coming down to the lounge in a cobalt blue suit, white shirt, uh, and a gold tie. I'll never forget it. And we sat in this like private lounge and um, we were chatting for a few minutes. He's very shy, very lovely man, very lovely man. And he said, um, can I ask you something personal? And I said, of course. And he said, do you believe in God? And I was like, yes, I do. And he goes, would you pray with me? And I said, sure. So we held hands. And he took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and prayed for the guidance for us to have a good creative union. And um, which I thought was very sweet. And... He asked if I had anything I wanted to add to the prayer. And I said, um, I pray for uh, the knowledge to share the best possible music and for your patience on the days when I don't. And he squeezed my hand. He said, amen. He said the contract would be delivered to my uh, office the next day. And it was. And then I didn't see him for another year. <laughs> and when it was to uh, go into a studio with him to um, to coach Mavis Staples through some dance tracks that she was demoing that never came out. Hopefully it'll come out someday. Um, it was very funny. He just called me at like two in the morning. As Prince, car does. Coming, as Prince does, mm -hmm. uh, sent a car to the airport, private plane, Minneapolis, Paisley Park. There's Mavis. I kind of, you know, mostly kind of needed to tell her that it wasn't the devil music and um, held her hand through a few of the sessions. And then uh, three hours later, I was in a car, in a plane, another car, on the way back to, on the way to work at Billboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was it. Yeah, so there was a, a three very strange years and it was good, you know? I mean, he was a lovely man, very generous uh, uh, financially, but also just generous in, in spirit. He was very nice always sent me a lovely card on my birthday and on Christmas. And um, yeah, passing was a great loss. Yeah. And, you know, and so it was the last period of time where he, you know, was connected to Warner Brothers. This was like right up until he dissolved everything, became like ampersand or whatever that signal was. And, and uh, I was told that he was, you know, not going to be Prince anymore. So like Somewhere in the like 93, 90, between 93, 93, in the 90s. Like that, yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. I don't remember the exact days, but it was in that area. Yeah. It was good. And good. now, and now, Larry, bring that forward now. All this that you, all mm -hmm. this knowledge you've bestowed upon me uh, in the last hour, bring this forward now with what you have going on today, um, which right. I love which I really love. I genuinely, I, I've been dying oh, to sweet. see what you were, where you were going to go next. Cause I do dearly miss you on Sirius. So um, now you're connected with Vero with let's talk. Music. Yes. I'm involved with, with the, the Vero to social, uh, social media platform. Uh, it happened um, in 2020. I got COVID. I got it very, very, very early in the pandemic, really didn't know I had COVID until 
after it was I survived it, but I had it, had uh, a near death experience, two operations, terrible, horrible, life changing experience. Um, and once I survived that, I uh, talked to my husband and said, "Okay, it's time for me to leave. I, you know, I don't want to be in New York anymore. I'm not happy." Um, as much as I love the people at Sirius, I wasn't loving my job anymore. It had become a bit, it just wasn't as exciting and or challenging as it, as it once was. And I just needed a break from life in America. Uh, and I missed my spirit home, which is Wales. So I left Sirius, left America, left everything, packed a few things in one bag and moved, uh, took six months off from the industry, from life, from work, and then started looking for a job, landed uh, in a meeting with the head of marketing at Vero, which I'd never heard of before, to be honest with you, um, and was invited to help cook up some ideas to beef up the music division similar to what they've been doing very successful with the film division with uh, Zack Snyder and um, started co coming up with some ideas and you know we did a kind of a, a kind of a, a look-see contract where I created something called New Music Moves which is a playlist that lives uh, on both Spotify and Apple um, and it's hashtag new music moves Vero, um, but it's a playlist that I curate. It's very similar to what I was doing on volume on Fridays, uh, except instead of coming up with 20 songs like I would do on volume, it's five new songs every Friday. Um, and it tends to be pretty multi-genre, though the audience for Vero is a little bit more pop and urban. So it tends to lean more toward pop and all pop and all rock. Um, and so that started to go well. And we started brainstorming about other things we could do together. And um, we had a, uh, an opportunity to do something with uh, a British media outlet. We demoed it, but then the deal didn't work out, but the demo was good. And so we decided to give it a shot. And uh, it's a digital talk show called Let's Talk Music. Um, I host it with uh, uh, Pete Winfield from the band Until the Ribbon Breaks. Great, great, great guy, a friend of mine of uh, over eight years. And, um, and it's a round table show. It's sort of an idea, fantasy I've had of doing something like this for many years, you know, of, of, uh, doing kind of a, a meet the press kind of conversational round table with artists and producers and songwriters um, in a very substantive, serious, meaning, you know, emotional way. Very similar to, you know, the, the thing that I learned when I started getting involved in Vero is that it's a social media platform that is troll free. Oh, I love working for them. There are no people saying, you're an asshole. You don't know what you're talking about. You're in the none of that it's all like i love this what do you love i love this oh really never heard of that i love this and it's all over the place meaning that it's hard rock it's country it's all you know, it's all these different things and it's you know big bands little bands a lot of emerging artists are part of it which is very exciting to me because that's really where my heart is and I just thought this is like a really cool place where people hang out and talk about music. If you know, like this, let's talk music idea of, you know, it was kind of like this woman who's now my partner in crime. She's the executive producer of the show. Her name is Jamie Jessup. Um, you know, she thought, okay, how, you know, she wanted to come up with ideas that would convey the emotionality of music as well as what really happens on Vero. And I start just bringing ideas from ideas that I would never get to do as serious because they could always come, they always came up with a reason why it wouldn't work. But 
she and the other people at Vero said, well, we don't know if it's going to work, but we can try it. And so we demoed four episodes and they were fun and they liked them. Vero liked them very much. So we've recorded four more and now we have a show. And it's uh, the first episode went up a couple weeks ago. Second episode goes up tomorrow. It's going to be every two weeks. And uh, the only thing that's every episode is me and Pete. And, you know, it, it's a lot of indie artists, a, a lot of uh, interesting producers. And, and we talk about things that range from, you know, mental health and the craft of songwriting to, you know, how your identity as a human being informs the music that you're writing or, or recording. Um, it's, it's, you know, deeper, a little more soulful. It's very much what we actually do on the platform, but in real time conversational form. Um, and it's fun because it's something I never thought I would get to do. You know, I thought when I left Sirius that, you know, that was the end of it. And I would just start inching closer to retirement. And, you know, these very adventurous, very creative people said, well, let's have some fun together. And I thought, well, hell yeah. <laughs> You know, and that's just, you know, and the thing is, you know, they've learned and they've allowed me to explore the fact that there are no wrong answers, just things that connect and things that don't connect. And the only mistake is in being, you know, being afraid to try it. So it's very creative. It's very fun. Um Right before you and I talked, I had a meeting with my with Jamie, my executive producer, about the next four episodes that we're going to tape. And, you know, it's ever evolving, you know, which is what a show should be. It's, it's what you see in these first four episodes are not what you're going to see in the, the next four, the next four, the next four. And we'll see. We'll see. Taking it four at a time. Incredible. <laughs> it's and fun. That's why I fell in it's love fun. with it. I fell in love with it, not just because of your presence on it, but because that's something that I myself have just been a champion for since I was born is basically just well, everything. It's what you're, do it's it's what you're doing. Yeah. It's what you're already doing, you know, Max. I mean, you know, I think that you should, you know, be proud of what you're accomplishing with this show that you're doing, you know, and I'm not just saying that because you've been very, very, very nice to me but also because i think you know the reason why i'm really thrilled to be on your show aside from the fact that you asked me and you know it made me feel nice to be asked is um you know i've watched the show i've listened to the show it's good it's a good show it's contributing to the conversation and you know that's important you know it's very very important to have people with a sincere love of what we, who we are and what we do contribute to the conversation. You know, it all builds, it all adds, you know, I hope you'll, you'll think about that when you have a bad day that you're contributing to the conversation in a really substantive way. And these are just early days, you're still a pup. You know, um, Larry, you have no idea, uh, not to get too deep here with you, but for, for someone like myself who is prone to um, episodes of anxiety and depression from time to time, that, that, those words. You mean like me? <laughs> that, that <laughs> really it means, one. it really means the world to me. You have no idea. Um, you've really made my, you've made my entire month, let's say, or the, or, oh, in the, or, the, or the year. Um, I really need to hear that. Seriously, that, that. Um, very sweet. Well, we. I mean, I mean it sincerely. I really, really do. I think, I think inflating people is cruel. I think it's the cruelest thing you could do to a person is to tell them nice things and have them, and not believe them to be true from your point of view. 
um, you know, I think you're doing good. I think you're doing good work. And and as someone who lives with crippling anxiety and depression, um, you know, I knew you were a kindred spirit. And I think, yeah, yeah, congratulations. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Larry. And just really quick, um, before I let you go, who is an artist that you've had on your show recently that you feel really has what it takes to go uh, the next to go to the next level? Oh my gosh, there's so many of them actually. Is there one in particular I, that really stood out for you? Yes, yes. There is a. I keep. I've talked about this guy until I'm blue in the face, and I will continue to do so. His name is Fancy Haygood. H a g o o d, fancy like fancy. Mm -hmm. He is um, from Nashville, and he just put out a single called "Bored," which is amazing. He's currently opening for L King on the road, who's also a great artist, and I love her to pieces. Um, he deals in R and B flavored country although his new single has much more of a mainstream pop feel very smart beautiful voice sings from the gut um he is uh, bold and brave and charismatic and i think that he is he's a star just waiting to be discovered and i will talk about him until people tell me to stop talking about him because i think he's that special I really do. And anybody, I mean, start with Board, which is a great song. He's only put out one album. It's called Southern Curiosity. It was my favorite record of, uh, of 2021. It was a record that kind of dealt in um, kind of churchy Southern soul with up-tempo songs that felt very kind of Beatle, ELO in flavor. Um, he likes a big production, which goes with his very big voice. Fantastic. I will make sure to make a note of it, a mental note of it, that is uh, to check him out. Then as soon as this check him out, tell me what you think. Board, I will, and I'll reach out to you immediately after. Uh, Larry, I, I have to get this off my list. Um, one last thing. I am a huge yeah. fan of 80s hard rock. Dare I say what they call hair metal, which I consider derogatory. Sure, me too. Sort sorts but i love the music of that the rock music of that era and every time you bring up listening to to music of that era i i freak out a little bit so i'm just curious <laughs> to know um who in particular who are the artists of that era that you are fond of and that you find yourself listening to a lot more than others um i actually have a really fun hair metal playlist that i was just listening to this morning um because it makes me happy um, and I got to tell you, one of my favorite songs from that era is Round and Round by Rat. I love that song. I think it's got one of the best hooks in of, of pop music of that era. Um, I mean, you know, I worked with Kiss for a bunch of years. So, you know, give me, I worked with them during the... Um, during the asylum animalized era so 84 is, 85 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i think heavens on fire is probably the best ever song i know people from the early days would call that blasphemy but i love heavens on fire Dem that's that's a desmond child co-write as well it is a different it is a desmond mm -hmm. child co-write mm -hmm. um i also um really liked um I mean, I, I kind of like them all. I mean, I was really into Poison for the fun of it. I was really into, uh, you know, L.A. Guns and Motley Crue. Um, I have a love-hate affair with Guns N' Roses. Um, I worked with a band that I still love called Keel that Gene Simmons produced. Um, the Right to Rock. That mm. was my record. I promoted that record um and callus which was a great fun band during that time they never really had their moment which is sad jeff scott um, soto was in that right mm-hmm mm -hmm. very much so um yeah i used to help procure girls for 
skill on the road. Um, and, you know, that was, they, they learned uh, very quickly that there's something very good about having a gay dude in your crew because they're not going to do things with the girls before they get to you. And they're also going to make sure that the girls are smart about things like safer sex and, you know, boundaries and all of that. So we had no, we had no oops, if you know what I mean, on the road. Um, yeah, I mean, I love that era. I what, love is it that era a lot. what is it about those songs? Because for me, it's there's an anthemic quality to a lot of those songs that I yeah, appreciate. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they kind of, first of all, at the core, they're all great pop songs, right? They're all beautifully structured pop songs. Um, but they they kind of they were they captured the the rawness of of youth and sexuality and you know life without the care that comes when you discover grunge and adulthood and the you know what I mean, which is all valid, and and I love all that too. But you know, I listen to those bands. I listen to Dokken and and um, Cinderella. Cinderella less so because his voice would get on my nerves after a while. <laughs> Lita Ford, I love Lita Ford. Um, you know, I listen to them when I want to kind of disappear into the part of rock and roll that always, always, always felt hopeful. That's why, you know, even though I was very well known, I'm still well known for having done dance music and I still do dance music. Um, but that's why my first specialty as a music journalist was metal. You know, I interviewed Metallica before Lars Ehrlich before uh, they became a big band for a magazine called Faces Rocks. Great, great magazine edited by Lorena Alexander. Um, yeah, I had the best time, had the best time with, with all those bands. Touring with Keel uh, as they were at war with um, with Ingve, who used to be in Keel, was mm -hmm. a trip. You know, we uh, were double headlining with, uh, with Loudness, who were lovely, if not very smart guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh really <laughs> you know they were very nice they just were not the brightest of people but they were very very nice and boy could they play holy smokes um but yeah it was a great period of music you know i mean in new york it was like lemores was like the place to go and you know i was very lucky because when i worked for kiss um I got to spend a lot of time with Eric Carr in the last couple of years of his life. And, you know, when he wasn't with the people who he was starting his label, he was with me and I would bring him to clubs and, you know, we'd hang out like dudes and, you know, all of that. We used to laugh because I'd point out girls and then he would jokingly point out guys and, and he had terrible taste in guys. So it never really worked out. <laughs> <laughs> He was a sweetheart. He was, I heard from everybody. He's the nicest man on the mm -hmm. planet. And it just devastated me when he died. Um, you know, I mean, working with Bruce Kulick was extraordinary. Brilliant guy, super shy. Um, but, a, but, you know, like a, a virtuoso on guitar. Really under, underrated. Um, you know, and of course the greatest day of my life was the day that I became friends with Rob Halford, um, who I'm still friends with to this day. And, um, you know, for a while we were AOL friends. Back then AOL was a big thing and you have, you know, the IMs and all of that. Um, I guess I can say now, cause it's not a thing. His, his uh, uh, AOL IM name was Worm Gun. And we would, you know, 
we would D, we would well now you would call it DM. We would I am uh, while he was on tour, and um, he's the greatest. Uh, every time I've seen him in any interview, he seems like the most genuine person on the planet. Yeah, yeah. he's not the he's metal god. A, he's he's just a person. You know, I mean, he. You know, I uh, yeah, I, I met him when he during the period of time that he was not in priest like fight um, two I, yeah yeah i met him in fight two uh and then halford and you know i remember going with him um on the road for a bunch of you know black metal fests where you know he was basically starting over again and uh you know he played those shitty festivals like they were Madison Square Garden and the really great thing is that you know he was treated with the utmost respect which he and I mean and I would be honest and saying I were surprised because he had just come out of the closet as gay and we thought oh well, being gay in metal is not going to be great being gay in metal is not a problem the easiest world I've moved actually the two easiest worlds that I've moved through as a man were country and heavy metal. The two that you're supposed to not think are friendly, but, um, but you know, we were great. It was fun. It's fantastic. Okay. Larry, thank you again for your time. You've given me all the time in the world and I really appreciate it. I do feel like I want, my I want a Grammy, honestly, for having you today. <laughs> uh, well, invite me back and we'll tell more. I'll tell you more stories. All right, we'll do. Thank you. We'll always have a seat here. Thank you so much, Larry. All the best. All to right, you. then. Bye-bye.